Very special occasion. Good morning, everyone. I'm City Librarian Luis Herrera, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the Richmond Library. Isn't this a wonderful space? It's absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am very honored and feel very privileged to be the city librarian and to have the library be at the center of the selection for San Francisco's Poet Laureate. Uh, this is my second experience uh, under uh, Mayor Newsom's administration, uh, but this is the fifth Poet Laureate, so we're delighted to have a very special announcement here at the library. Mr. Mayor, I want to thank you for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, to uh, bring the announcement to the Richmond. Uh, to make it here at the neighborhood. It's an opportunity to preview this beautiful library uh, that will open tomorrow. It's a grand reopening of the Richmond Library, uh, the first Carnegie in the city uh, from 1914. Also very much a part of our success with the Branch Library Improvement Program. This is number 10 out of 24, so we're on a, on a great roll. The, uh, and then secondarily, I think it's important that we have this announcement in the neighborhood because the San Francisco Poet Laureate has an amazing tradition of being a poet of the people. And the neighborhood, the library, what better place to celebrate this wonderful announcement with our wonderful new Poet Laureate. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Mayor Gavin Newsom, who will do the honors. Mayor, thank you for being Thanks, here. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, uh, well, it's great to be, get a preview uh, of this library, and congratulations. It is, by the way, just to, parenthetical to what uh, was just referenced, we now in the 10th of our 24 library, our branch improvement program, but it's an extraordinary commitment that the public made a number of years ago when they passed not just one bond, but a second bond to continue the work uh, and to make sure that we completed the job. And what contrast it is to be in a city like San Francisco, in spite of its huge budget challenges, where we're actually expanding hours in the last 12 months of our libraries, expanding them in the evenings, expanding them on Sundays, uh, and investing an unprecedented amount of capital uh, in improving the physical uh, conditions in all of our libraries. So we're very, very proud of that. And I think it's important to sort of reflect on that uh, again, because I don't know of another city in the country that can lay claim to that. And so I'm very, very proud to be here. I'm proud of Louise's leadership and stewardship of this library system. I'm very thankful that all of you took the time to be here. And it's indeed an honor for me to have the opportunity, not for the first time, but now the second time, uh, to appoint uh, a poet laureate uh, to our city. This is a tradition, as you recall, went back uh, to the previous administration uh, when Lawrence Ferlinghetti uh, took the baton and has now passed it on uh, and will officially pass that baton on uh, from Jack Hirschman uh, to uh, Diane as our fifth poet laureate. This is uh, long overdue in our city. You would have expected a generation ago that we would have established this framework in our city and the tradition would have gone back much, much longer uh, than it has. But nonetheless, I'm very proud of it. Uh, as I was, and I don't see Jack here, of his stewardship of the poet laureate position. Jack and I never, well, I put it this way, we didn't always agree uh, on every issue. Uh, and I knew I went into this with some risk uh, and peril that uh, I would be a point of scorn for him uh, even after I appointed him. I'd expected nothing less. I would never have appointed him uh, if I expected it would have changed his tone and tenor, quite the contrary. Uh, and I have admired him even more uh, because I think he did an outstanding job uh, as a steward. Uh, of that position and really democratize the position even more by reaching out, as Luis said, into the neighborhoods and also reaching out around the world and internationalizing our status, uh, which I will think is, was really important and I think has raised the bar as well. So he had a strategy of both going deep into the community and then broadening that strategy in the broadest context to uh, ar uh, folks around the rest of the world. And so I look forward to extending that tradition uh, with our new Poet Laureate. I have had the privilege of reading through a lot of not only poetry, but a lot of opinions uh, that opinion makers have, a lot of letters, a lot of lobbying associated with this position. Uh, we put together an advisory committee and we asked them to go out and, uh, and consider uh, who the best 
uh, candidates would be. Uh, they came back, uh, and it's never an easy decision uh, with a number of names. And then with the names come stacks of books. Uh, and no time they allot you to read through, uh, but plenty of information that's provided. The uh, commissioners that are here uh, go through as well uh, and basically uh, either reinforce or redirect uh, the work group that is tasked with identifying uh, some key names. Um, our poet laureate that we're announcing today, his name is familiar to me not just in this round, uh, but was right there with Jack uh, as a name that I was going back and forth uh, as it relates to the decision we made a number of years ago. Um, and I, you know, you never know what the right decision is, uh, but I indeed was very pleased to see uh, Diane's name back in the mix this time because I felt horribly guilty uh, because we literally, Mike Farrow was in the office and said, well, what do you think? Back and forth, what do you think? Back and forth. It was a really tough decision last time. And I just thought because Jack was so negative in my campaign that I thought <laughs> we just have to have, I think it's so appropriate uh, that Jack be the right person the first time. I, I don't want to say that was as simple as the decision was. Uh, he deserved it on every level, uh, but we thought uh, we thought we'd, we'd go there first. So I uh, was very pleased, as I said, uh, to see uh, Diane uh, De Parm uh, Primas. And I love De Prima. I've learned so much about you now and your, your background and your history and your uh, family. And, uh, and I want to just share a little bit of that with you. And I, I thought uh, I'd write some things down so I'd get it right. Some of this you may not want to hear. Uh, most of it I think you do. Uh, but for those of you who are not familiar uh, with Diane, uh, she was born in Brooklyn. New York in 1934, not too many years ago, second generation, it's right, second generation uh, American of Italian, surprise, descent. She began to write at age seven, probably was writing well before then, but formally, I think, at age seven, committed herself to a life of poetry at the remarkably early age, finding what you love at the age of 14 is indeed remarkable. She lived in, wrote in Manhattan for years uh, and became very well known uh, as an important writer of the beat movement. And for the past 34 years, she's lived and worked wisely in Northern California. Though you had a few years here, and then you Stinson Beach and also then you made your way back uh, to the West East Coast, but then decided... 68. So it's, even, it's about when I started life, actually. <laughs> we share that. Well, about the, the same time. Um, so for the past 40 years, uh, took part in political activities of the diggers and wrote revolutionary letters. She studied Zen and Tibetan Buddhism, um, Sanskrit, how interesting, and alchemy, and raised her five remarkable, five children. Are your children here? Any? Unbelievable. And all that sacrifice. And, uh, <laughs> um, in abstentious. Author of remarkable 43 books. Many I see right there and they're on my desk as well. Including pieces of a song. Her work has been translated into at least 20 languages. And you've received grants for your poetry from the National Endowment of Arts and of course from many other organizations. 1993, you received an award of lifetime achievement in poetry. 1993, lifetime achievement. And Michael, we just said hello, Michael, congratulations uh, from the National Poetry Association. Well done. And in the spring of 2000, you, uh, she was a master poet in resident at Columbia College in Chicago. And in 2002, was one of the three finalists, not just for this position, but the Poet Laureate position in our great state of California. I was reading, the, Allen Ginsberg wrote a wonderful, uh, uh, just a few words, but I what a writer himself, and just reading this. Uh, yeah, I struggled to read it because I have to reread it to sort of really appreciate it. Uh, but Diane de Prima, revolutionary activist of 1960s beat literary renaissance, heroic in life and poetics, learned humorous, bohemian, classically educated, and 20th century radical. Her writing, informed by Bu uh, Buddhist equanimity, is exemplary in a majest political and mystical modes. A great woman poet in second half of American century. She broke barriers of race, class, identity, and delivered a major body of verse, brilliant in its par particularity. 
as a dyslexic, those words were more difficult than they may appear. Particularity, I love that. So it's my great honor, Luis, to formally announce uh, what we've already informally announced, our fifth poet laureate in our great city and county of San Francisco, Diane de Primo. Diane, congratulations, and welcome to the new role. my five kids? <laughs> I just wanted to be very brief. We're going to do a um, more formal inaugural thing. I don't know what you call it. Inaugural event um, in the not too distant future. So I, I don't want to take a lot of time now. There's a lot of stuff going on. It's 11 o'clock in the morning in San Francisco, people got to do this and that. Is this thing, it doesn't work or it does? Mostly internal night, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, um, first I want to just thank you very much, and thank you for picking me. I'm really honored, and I, it's quite wonderful to follow Lawrence, Janice Maricatani, Devora Major, and Jack Hirschman. What a crew. I'm really awed. And, um, if you go back farther, there was, I can't remember, Michael, you might remember which mayor it was that gave the keys to the city to Robert Duncan. That was in the days before we had poet laureates, but there was that one acknowledgement. Yeah, that was good. I wanted to remember that. And I want to say libraries, man, libraries. I would be dead if it wasn't for libraries. They were like shelter, they were like information, they were like everything you couldn't find out at school. They were a place to be. When I was in second grade, my father took me in Brooklyn, the six blocks from my house to the Carroll Street Branch Library and home again. He said, now you know how to get there. I got your card. You're on your own, which was delightful. I wasn't on my own about anything else. They were always peering over my shoulder, so there it was. And I started to read my way through sections. And that's what I would do until suddenly I discovered poetry and then I didn't read my way through any other section. I couldn't understand why anybody would bother with philosophy where they had to be consistent, whereas in a poem we could hold all the inconsistency. I couldn't understand why they'd bother with fiction. I mean, I read some and liked it, but the world was so much more incredibly complex than any fiction book I ever read except maybe Genji, The Tale of Genji. And, um, and it was, you know, it was where you, where you could go when it was too crazy in the house, which was Italian-American family, second generation. I'd say 99% of the time it was too crazy in the house. So it was good to have that. And I want to, that's, I want to say I want to do, I'm hoping to do lots of stuff in libraries. I'm hoping, I have my dream is to do things with little kids, things with older people, and have events that are writing you don't have to know how to write to write. We'll use a mic, we'll use a tape machine, a play. Let's do it this way. I'm just hoping to be able to do some of that. I want to, I'm here to, I hope that I will be here to serve the city. This is a very, very great city. And the very first time I laid eyes on it in 1961, I flew out to visit Michael McClure and stay with him for a few weeks, three weeks with my, I was a single mom, I came out on a prop plane, non-sked, that was supposed to get me to San Francisco, but got me to Burbank, <laughs> which was a little distance away, <laughs> with my four-year-old daughter. And uh, from the first moment, I knew this is where I had to be. And after that, the coming and going was kind of like more, um, well, it's in my book, Sue, but, um, I moved out permanently, I thought, in 67, but I had a crazy husband who said that he would go crazy here, but he almost was crazy, so we took him back to the East Coast. I shipped him off to India and moved back out. Had a 14-room house on the panhandle of the park for $300 a month. 
and I've been here ever since. <laughs> a few years in Marshall on the coast. So I want the city, I think of it as the city, but I think of it, the city to me is mostly its people. Many, all the very, very, very different kinds of people, the very different kinds of poetry that's happening, all the musics, all the arts, it's just a wonder. You can never be bored here. You can never not find out something new here. It's just, I'm, I'm longing to jump into that and be of use to it. Be of use to it. And most of all, most of all, I, to just serve poetry. I had a dream about a week ago in which again, I, once in a while, it gets showed, it was showed to me that all the work that was ever written is like we're all we're writing on the same one big piece. And it doesn't matter where one of us stops because it's like not like, oh my God, I have to finish this section of this big piece. It's like it's just happening. We're all writing on this one huge monster piece that cuts through time, cuts through space, and we have no idea what it is. It's so, it's so wonderful and large. And so my feeling is my deepest service is to poetry and to humans. And I hope I can be of some use and benefit to people here. Thank you. They asked, Marsha asked me, um, or I asked her, or someone asked somebody else, um, should I read? And I'm going to be read only two poems. One of them is kind of like a reminiscence of being here in the 60s, in the early, well, when the, when the first parts of the, de the dead played last night, right? My son borrowed my car and went down to somewhere or other. Um, that's probably why he's not here. <laughs> it's a poem for Pigpen. And then I want to read a poem that people, it's kind of like one of my signature poems, it's called Rant. And then we'll do reading, talking, whatever, when we have the inaugural. But this is just for now. Is there my water over there? Could I have that water? Thanks. For pig pen. Velvet at the edge of the tongue. At the edge of the brain, it was velvet. At the edge of history. Sound was light, like tracing ancient letters with your toe on the floor of the ballroom. They came and went, hotel guests, like the great Gatsby, and wondered at the music. Sound was light. Jagged sweeps of discordant light, aurora borealis over some cemetery, a bark, a howl at the edge of history, and there was no time. Shouts trace circles of breath, all futures. Time was this light and sound spilled out of it, flickered and fell under blue windows. False dawn and too much wind. We come round, make circles, Blank as a clock, spill velvet damage on the edge of history. And this other poem belongs to an endless book I write on called Revolutionary Letters, and it's called Rant. Rant. Yeah. I think it sort of speaks for itself. The word polis, polis was a Greek city-state. They said it shouldn't be bigger than you could walk around in two days. You cannot write a single line without a cosmology, a cosmogony laid out before all eyes. There is no part of yourself you can separate out saying, this is memory. This is sensation. This is the work I care about. This is how I make a living. It is whole. It is a whole. It always was whole. You do not make it so. There's nothing to integrate. 
You are a presence. You are an appendage of the work. The work stems from, hangs from, the heaven you create. Every man, every woman, carries a firmament inside. And the stars in it are not the stars in the sky. Without imagination, there is no memory. Without imagination, there is no sensation. Without imagination, there is no will, desire. History is a living weapon in your hand, and you have imagined it. It is thus that you find out for yourself. History is the dream of what can be. It is the relation between things in a continuum of imagination. What you find out for yourself is what you select out of an infinite sea of possibility. No one can inhabit your world, yet it is not lonely. The ground of imagination is fearlessness. Discourse is videotape of a movie of a shadow play, but the puppets are in your hand, your counters, in a multidimensional chess, which is divination and strategy. The war that matters is the war against the imagination. All other wars are subsumed in it. The ultimate famine is the starvation of the imagination. It is death to be sure. But the undead seek to inhabit someone else's world. The ultimate claustrophobia is the syllogism. The ultimate claustrophobia is it all adds up. Nothing adds up, and nothing stands in for anything else. The only war that matters is the war against the imagination. The only war that matters is the war against the imagination. The only war that matters is the war against the imagination. All other wars are subsumed in it. There is no way out of the spiritual battle. There's no way you can avoid taking sides. There is no way you can not have a poetics no matter what you do. Plumber, baker, teacher, you do it in the consciousness of making or not making your own world. You have a poetics. You step into the world like a suit of ready-made clothes or you etch in light. Your firmament spills into the shape of your room, the shape of the poem, of your body, of your loves. A woman's life, a man's life is an allegory. Dig it. There's no way out of the spiritual battle. The war is a war against the imagination. You can't sign up as a conscientious objector. The war of the worlds hangs here, right now, in the balance. It is a war for this world, to keep it a veil of soul making. The taste in all our mouths is the taste of our power. And it is bitter as death. Bring yourself home to yourself. Enter the garden. The guy at the gate with the flaming sword is yourself. The war is the war for the human imagination. And no one can fight it but you. And no one can fight it for you. The imagination is not only holy. It is precise. It is not only fierce. It is practical. Men die every day for the lack of it. It is vast and elegant. Intellectus means light of the mind. It is not discourse. It is not even language. The inner sun. The polis 
is constellated around the sun. The fire is central. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diane. We know that the Poet Laureate is in wonderful hands and there will be no starvation of the imagination uh, with you at the helm. I want to take a moment before we close to recognize some of our library commissioners. I know our Vice Chair Lee Munson is here, Lonnie Chin and Larry Kane. Thank you for joining us. And also, I noticed that one of our past Poet Laureates, Devorah Major, is here. Thank you for joining us, Devorah. And Janice Merikitani. Where is Janice? Do we see Janice? And where's Jan Janice? Thank you for joining us. Another poet laureate, Janice Mirakitani, is here. Wonderful. And uh, in closing, our appreciation and thank you to the selection committee. I know many members are here. If you could raise your hand, we really owe you a great debt of uh, gratitude. Thank you for doing that. And Marcia Schneider from the library, who coordinated the effort, thank you very much for joining us. We very much look forward to the inaugural event with Diane DePrima. Thank you once again. Have a great day. Thank you.